Bing. Uh, dun, 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 open the chat. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I'm dressed up in my Bills gear today. That's right. Woo! Go Bulls. Um, all right, I'll sit down briefly, but not for long today. All right. Uh, I still have to put up um, study guide. This was a busy weekend. It's, it's, I mean, the study guide is like the same study guide as last time. It's a handful of terms, all of which I've emphasized. Uh, and, but I will put it up and a link, you know, for the taken for a ride, the transportation piece, I guess, starting off today. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Just put some ice in my coffee because now it's a new drink. It was coffee from this morning until a few seconds ago. Now it's iced coffee. Anybody, no questions? When's the next exam? That's a good question, Josh. Uh, next exam opens this Thursday and it is open until Saturday afternoon. So Thursday to Friday. Um, does the, so yeah, anyway, don't miss this exam. Uh, you know, you don't have to take it right away on Thursday. You can take it Friday, you can take it Saturday morning. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, Katie, I do believe that I got back to you an email just a short bit ago, uh, unless there's two 10.5 questions. Does food waste paper need to be an 11 point font? Can it be 10.5? Yes. But here's why I say a certain font. Because usually people will do something magical not usually, once in a rare, rarely, just almost never really, somebody won't type that much and then highlight everything and set it to like 13 font, you know what I'm talking about, or 12, and it's like, yes, I did it, I did it. And then um, when we grade the papers, I just highlight it and shrink it down to 11. Oh, <laughs> so, you know, I just have a font requirement there. Um, smaller is fine. I get, and I suggested subheadings. I'm fine with subheadings. I don't want them to take up too much room. Um, and again, you know, if you're writing a little bit more, that's better than a little bit less for this big paper, right? I mean, you know, if you go over by a half a page or something like that, cause you're, you know, you're interested in your topic. Oh, a hammock, that looks fantastic. Um, anyway, so yeah, all of that, so comment yep how should the site in uh, site food wastage footprint impacts on natural uh one of the three articles is that one of the three sources i think that's posted should be a name associated with that somewhere um find an author let me look at that after class uh, i know it's one of the required ones but if there's if there's not an author listed let me let me look um, or Google the title of that paper and you should come up with the author of it. Really, that seems I could, I'm kind of talking right now, but if somebody could do that, that'd be great. Will I be uploading the slides in this last class? They have just been uploaded uh, a few minutes ago to YouTube. Um, so they're there. Uh, no, no, don't worry about it. Taylor, yep. Okay, all right. So I'm all cut up with the chat on the side. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? Same thing, uh, this is just two chapters, 50 questions, multiple choice, true, false. I took a look at it um, yesterday. And there was three things that I was like, <laughs> and so I sent that to Asmal and uh, I think he'll probably end up changing those or coordinating those. But just remember that the text is fair game. What were those questions? Um, I'll, I'll look, but I think I asked him to replace them with other ones from Taken for a Ride, that transportation documentary, even though it's only, uh, you know, 50 minutes or an hour long type thing, just under an hour, we are going to ask some questions from it. And we had a great discussion about it too. Uh, all right. So no further questions. All right. Let's take a break today. And I have a quick roll. question. Okay, hold on. Let me put, I just I can't find the quiz on the um, canvas. It'll be there. It's not published right now because we're still making okay. it. Okay. Um, and I, I don't want it to be open accidentally early or something like that. Uh, but it, you'll you'll see it there because I thought a few of those questions were a little nitpicky. Uh, it wasn't 
like Asmal didn't upload it last night. He's going to do that today, but that's Thursday for everybody. So yeah, no problem. A little more chill in your dorm today, perhaps? It's kind of wild last time. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, so yeah, let's, I'm going to roll up my sleeves again. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about seeds and seed sprouting and seed saving today. Um, <clears throat> will the, okay, hold on. I'm going to look over here one last time and then I'm going to cancel out of this chat so that I don't keep getting distracted. Slides, slides are uploaded to YouTube already. Look, the article says the author, Office of Assistant General Director. That's fine if you refer to the title of it or abbreviate it or something like that. Um, long as we know which one you're you're looking at. Okay, so hold on a second, chat. Yep, I had to had to put that aside. Okay, so seed saving, planting seeds, growing food. Uh, what do you know about it? What don't you know about it? Um, how many people here like do a garden? How many people just do like a little window garden or help somebody else, even if you don't have space in your place? How many people are doing a patio, like patio food or garden or flowers of some sort? Um, anyway, uh, I want to talk a little bit about that today um, because it's that time, right? Also, I think that generally speaking, it's good that we know, you know, the difference between like an organic seed or a GMO seed and why you can't just take an apple from the store that you found was fantastically delicious and slice it in the middle and take those seeds and go be whomever apple seed, right? Uh, there's reasons for that, right? Um, so I guess starting off, um, we're gonna do a couple of things today. So starting off, I guess I'll start off this because this is like a cooking show, uh, except it's gonna take a few minutes for these things to happen. So, all right, these are Jiffy 7s. And Jiffy 7s, some of you have seen them before. They're really, really thin. They look like little coins uh, and they are filled with compressed peat moss. So uh, you can start seeds in all sorts of things, cocoa root, um, you know, or, or, or I guess even like plant cuttings, um, if you're cloning plants. Uh, but this I find is like my favorite, uh, substrate or way to do new seeds. Ah, sorry, just dropped that one. Um, and so what you do right now, they're dry. You need something to plant seeds in. It, it can't, it can't be something with a pH that is too much one way or the other. So these are very neutral or exactly neutral pH. I'm going to drop these now in some water. It's a wallaby organic. This is some really good yogurt though. I'm gonna tell you what. All right, dropping them into some warm water. Okay, so here they are floating around and uh, we're just gonna let them float there. What these things are gonna do is expand like six times their size and then you'll have, this is warm water, and then you'll have warm, like a warm peat moss kind of like little circle thing. And you, these, these go pretty fast. Wow, I can already see them. I already see them kind of starting to thicken up there. Um, but when we look at just a few minutes, it'll be very different than how thin that is. Okay, so you're wanting to plant seeds. What kind of seeds should I buy? What kind of plants should I plant? Um, I would say that a lot of people, a lot of people don't start seeds. We actually plant, uh, do a lot of seed saving. Um, and maybe I'm not sure if a documentary that we watched already, I don't think we watched Food Inc. in here this semester, but I do believe it's that movie, which is uh, most people have seen by now that talks about, you know, farmers who used to, of course, always and very robustly save their seeds. That was safety and security for the next year, right? Um, and so when you're doing organic crops, when you're doing like heirloom seeds, things that have been passed down, things that have not been genetically modified nor irradiated so that they purposefully will not reproduce, um, then you're holding life, not sort of life, not a metaphor for it, but exactly that. So a lot of people, um, when they start gardens, buy from like a Home Depot, right? or some plant place, hopefully like a local greenhouse, you're supporting a local business. But even those plants, a lot of those plants are genetically modified. And so if you plant those plants, might be a fantastic plant, you're not gonna be able to do any seed saving for the next year. So it's, it's not, one of the reasons that I'm, you know, I'm not 
pro GMO in, in any way whatsoever. Uh, I think it's messing with nature's perfect thing already. And not on a religious level, just on a real basic level. Um, I know some people that actually, because of their religion, oppose GMO stuff. So it, it could be all over the place with it. But if you want a plant that you can grow an awesome tomato and cut it open at the end of the year for a few of them and then save those seeds, and I'll kind of show you about that, then you have a free crop for the next year, right? You have everything you need for the next year or that next year or the next year. Now, of course, each year that you, each time you clone a plant, unless it's a mother plant that just keeps going forever and ever, it's sometimes difficult to maintain the health of that. But if you're going like a seed and you save it and the next year you plant that and then you save that, there's going to be some reduction in like yield. Um, there's going to be a, it's going to be a bit less effective, but the reason you save seeds is because you're saving seeds this year. And the guy down the street was saving seeds. And this person over there has a farm and they're saving seeds. And so this becomes really, really important because maybe something of yours is not got, quite got the traits that you want or producing anymore at a, like a really robust level. So you're done with those, you get new seed, Right. And what happens, I think, is a sort of an economic disadvantage. It's cheaper to grow food when you're not spending a lot of money on fertilizers and on pesticides. It's cheaper to grow food when you save seeds. If you have to rebuy your entire seed stock every year, it costs extra money. That wouldn't have been a component of what farmers were doing forever, really, until you know, sometime in the late 70s and maybe it finally comes to the markets and things like that and is available to people in the early 80s. So right out of the bat, um, what kind of seeds you're saving or what kind of seeds you wanna plant will matter for whether or not that next year you have to buy all new seeds again or whether you're gonna try and seed save. Now I think seed saving is, is really, really exciting. I'll give a couple examples of it here. Usually I go around the farm and I grab like a cattail thing and I bring it into a big classroom and I just go tap and I like barely tap it. And it's like, it just boom, you can't even see me anymore. But this is my house and I don't have people who are paid to clean it. It's actually me. So I'm not gonna do that example this year. Um, but I have a couple of things that I'll show you how to kind of get the seeds out of. Let's check on our, <laughs> I like doing this, let's check on our peat moss cubes and oh, 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 check it out, Ta -da! oh. So instead of like a half an inch thick now, it's like an inch and a half, maybe a, maybe a little bit more, almost two inches and it's squishy and it's got water in it, right? And, and inside there is just peat moss. So a really fantastic and neutral substrate to plant your plants. So what we usually do is burp, Put a pencil down in there, go like that, and get the hole, which is a little difficult to see, but get the hole a little bigger, you know, so that you can drop the seeds down. So you probably already know this. I'm not trying to be redundant. I'm just kind of doing an overview. And maybe some of you want to plant a garden. But I know a lot of, I mean, I know a lot of my friends with houses. My buddy built like several hundred dollars worth of garden boxes last year and couldn't get any seeds to sprout. <laughs> you know, he just this wasn't doing it correctly. And there is a way to do it so that you have almost 100% success uh, instead of it being kind of a hit and miss thing. Um, and then of course, if you miss like he did, then there's all sorts of places. Our farm sells, you know, I, I mean, I planted over 2000 seeds. So we're gonna have over 2000 plants, a lot of them for sale. That would be like, you know, across the board. So somebody, if you're not good at sprouting seeds, that's not a big deal, but this should help. So warm water, now you have this thing, it's warm. And for tomato seeds, maybe it's a half an inch. For flowers, sometimes for flowers, it says just barely cover. So if you take a bunch of flower seeds, take you know the, the pencil, jam it to the bottom of this thing and, and bury them, they're not gonna be able to come up. you know. And, and so you have to think of kind of the origin of the seed, right? Like a lot of seeds, I mean, okay, last night, um, so Sunday morning I was going around and let me tell you, when you hide Easter eggs in a house, that's one thing. When you have a four acre farm, you best be prepared to be outside, son. And they were for like three hours. I have, I have four acres to hide eggs and chocolate and whatever on. In the midst of that, I got a whole bunch of uh, cockleburrs or whatever on me. And, and, right? and so I'm picking them off. They're going through my sweatshirt last night. That's an example of how seeds transfer. 
right? I mean, they're ingenious, just like mycelium. And I know that Paul Stamets is talking about they usually spread like right on a trail rather than kind of, you know, in places where you don't think they were. Um, but seeds are really ingenious as well, whether that's the cattails and air hits it or my boys are like sword fighting with them and thousands released, right? We actually found a bunch of those, brought them to the pond so that we would increase the biodiversity, the habitat for birds like uh, red winged blackbirds and just did that over there. Now we've got a whole section of the pond that's got them and they also filter the water, right? They help keep the water clean. They provide food, they provide housing for birds and things like that. So seeds are super ingenious but a lot of wildflower seeds just drop, you know? And so if you think about it, you, they're just dropping off. They're not, nobody's burying them. So nobody can really bury them too deeply. And, and that's where they go. Years ago, I didn't have much luck with, um, sorry, I'm looking to get these out of the water. Didn't have much luck uh, with wildflowers because I buried the seeds way too deep. All right, so there are the three of them. There they are for the side. And, so anyway, so seeds are ingenious um, and, and they're, I, you know, I'm spreading them all around the farm. You do the same thing when you're walking, when the wind goes, when animals go by, but you want to plant a garden. So you get those, you put the seeds in at the depth you're supposed to, then you just kind of like, you know, use your finger, keyboard. Yeah, so like close it up. Um, then what a lot of people don't do is they kind of put them in a window or they put them somewhere at this point, I would give the seeds in any plant right now that you're growing in a vegetative state 24 hours of light. You know, just give them as much light as they can so they can grow as fast as they can. Plants will automatically sense the time of year it is and the amount of daylight. And once they get to the right amount of light, it'll trigger that fruit production or whatever that is. Usually it's around 12, 12, 12 hours and 12 hours. So I will go get a tray. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Let me show you then. This is what a tray looks like when they're filled. Okay. So there's like, I don't know, 70 to nine, maybe it's more like 90 of these. I can't remember. This one has calendula, a lemon balm, Julie. I guess this is a whole bunch of herbs. Julie's doing a whole bunch of herbs and the ones at the back. Oh, some kind of marigold. It looks like cannabis, really. These, these ones over here in the end, they get these little cutty leaves that are the second leaves. They all have like their first leaves and then their second leaves. But this is a tray. And we take this, imagine them, because some of these, look, don't have anything popping through. So they look like the ones that I just did. And then you put them on a heating pad, okay? So if you don't put them on a heating pad, and this is where a lot of people kind of miss this part, it's not helping them germinate. Those little things, these will get cold, right? They'll get like 60 degrees. They need to be more like 70 some degrees uh, or 50 or depending, right? Like what temperature does it get down to in your house? Is it by a window? Does it get cold at night? So getting a heating pad or even making a heating pad, which you can do with tubing and water and there's all sorts of cool ways to do it. But you could buy a heating pad, you put them on top of that, some kind of grow light, like a fluorescent vegetative light. They sell those. Um, and then you've got light so that once they emerge, then it's really pulling it out. Now, biodynamics, go ahead and look up like biodynamic planting. They've got a really great biodynamic planting calendar online. And it just follows patterns and moon patterns. And I know it sounds weird, but we planted right as the full moon was emerging. And the next morning last week, I don't know if I mentioned this, not to this class or the other class, the next morning there was green stuff popping up and so if it can move oceans and tidal waves and things like that, then moon cycles and when you plant as certain things are also have to do with a lot of stuff besides just this is what we know, right? Um, biodynamic seed planting. Did I talk about that last time where you put the seeds in your mouth? No? Oh, wow. Uh, and this is, I believe, a really old, I want to say it comes from Russia, a really old Russian method of seed planting, but it's like Farmers would say that the seed would know what you need from the plant, what nutrients you need. If when you're planting the seeds, you put the seeds in your mouth, they connect with your saliva and then you plant them. I love the faces that I see. People are like, what? 
So Julie and I, about three years ago, I was like, and I was like, Julie, and she's like, no, 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 no. It's going to be just, just don't, you know, we did it. And she's like, got lots of energy. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. Uh, so we're out in the garden with these seed packets, putting them in our mouth. Now, not all those seeds taste very good at all. I will tell you that. And then you're kind of there spitting into the holes that you have made. But I have not stopped doing it because in three years, whether it's the temperature of your spit, right? And then you put them in the, the earth and then they already are a little wet. Whatever that is, whether that plant seed can actually realize what nutrients you might need or recognize your DNA, I can't support that. I just, a lot of science in this class, that I can't support. But I will say biodynamic methods of planting, since we started doing stuff like that, it's a difference. It's, a, it's like not using any mycelium, kind of mushroom powder, right? Which will give your plants like more protection against like pests and resistant to disease as well as get their roots to really, really be better. It's like that. It's the, the difference is truly um, night and day. So a lot of the seeds that we sprout, we suck on first. I know that sounds strange, but uh, try it, I guess, or don't. Um, all right, so keep those things warm. They're eventually gonna come up and then, All right, so this was just planted, I think a week and a half ago. I mean, it's ridiculous. There's like five, okay, so to conceptualize this, we're putting multiple seeds in each one of these. So now let's take a look. Oh, this is so awesome. These are all tomatoes, I love tomatoes. Okay, check it. All right, look at the bottom. So this is what happens, the roots, start growing out through that little, there's like a little netting around the peat moss. I keep that there and I just plant them or you can kind of peel it away. And I'm gonna to have to peel it away for this, right? Because there's three little baby tomato plants in here. And you have, I mean, this is, okay. So this is the work right here. That's the gentle work, right? Because if you, if you at all take this thing here and snap it, it it's done, you know? But right now, the way it is, even if it doesn't have giant roots, you peel this, and I'll show you up close. It's like a little wrapping. And then this is peat moss, and then just very gently, you separate them. So it gives you an idea. I put four or five seeds in each one of these. There's 90 of them. If even three or four come up out of each one, I mean, this, this tray here has six or 700 plants. And so you can, this is in one tray that's like, I don't even know, it's 16 inches by, by a foot, it's, it's or, or 18 by 12. That's a lot of food. That's why when you hold like a packet of seeds in your hand and you see a bunch of dots on your hand, it's like, eh. But when you see that that is this in a week and a half, ah, oh, it's, pow it's powerful, it's amazing, really, you know? Um, so that thing has, what, what are these tomatoes? These are, I don't wanna drop it, but. So these are all organic. These are chocolate cherries, black crims, burgundies, money makers, Ace 55, beef steaks, pole cherries, and sweetie tomatoes, okay? Now, uh, I think heirloom varieties might not be guaranteed to be organic, but they are like passed on. So they're not modified in a genetic way. You could take two plants. Same is true just about anything and if, if you can pollinate it, right, with one kind of plant and it's another one, then maybe you've done crossbreeding, which is again, very different than genetic modification, okay? So if it's an heirloom seed, you can save those seeds. If it's an organic seed, you can save those seeds. So all those plants right there, we'll sell half of those plants, we'll plant half of those plants, we'll give, last year we gave several hundred away to like a daycare, uh, or a place that works with little kids and they wouldn't have, they don't have any access to gardening, like, you know, lower income families without any place to do that. And so then those kids can, you know, can do something um, with it. Anyway, um, so that's just the potential right there. Yes, we will save these seeds. They're easy to save. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. I've got my knife behind me. So let's take my keyboard. I'll put the keyboard over here. And so once you grow it, then 
imagine like it, i don't have any big tomatoes but if you cut open a tomato or something right like that think of how many seeds there are uh, in any given plant we went out the other day because uh are they marigolds because we planted a bunch of marigolds last year and they're an organic variety that i think we sprouted this year and we hadn't been out to the garden in months and we went out there it's wild as the marigold dies the top of it bends over right and the seeds eventually fall out replanting themselves and so we grabbed a bunch of those that were dry we clipped them and now because you know i mean if you're getting even 20 seeds and it's three bucks for a packet of seeds that's a lot compared to if you grow that packet of seeds you're gonna have you know hundreds a thousand marigold seeds uh like we do this year and then can replant all of those so to me that's why organics are important because and this is how important it is they have i believe stopped a lot of operations in mexico from growing genetically modified strains of corn because they were cross-pollinating these ancient strains of corn that people have literally been saving for hundreds of years that food is their culture it's not like their culture it's exactly their culture and so it, as those operations the gmo operations are happening the pollination cross pollination was happening then of course those companies come along they test your corn even though it's your ancient strain it has a little bit of our genetically modified corn we own the patent we sue you or make you destroy your crop it's crippling for farmers the fact that they would go around and prevent farmers from saving seeds is why i like I don't like the term seed bomb, but it's why I like rebel planting of seeds, whatever that is, restoring wildflower populations. I don't know, you name it. I think it's very, very, very countercultural to save seeds, plant seeds, start gardens, and empower people to grow their own food and to pass that on. So to me, I think there's, a, there's just a tremendous amount of value in it. Now, all right. So You've either used the seeds that you've saved, you've planted them, and when we plant them, and I, do, uh, when we go to transplant them, we plant them in a real neutral soil. Then a soil we combine it that has a little bit of stuff in it, um, you know, manure and stuff like that. And then we add some mycorrhiza. So I'm not sure what the name of the brand is. You can write down mycorrhiza. Uh, it's like R H I Z Z. There's an H in there, a, but it's basically mushroom dust. And in the Stamets video, they showed the, the two plants side by side with the root balls. That's not just something that Stamets does like, so like, oh, look, this one time it happened. Hands down, the plants that we start, not only for other people, but that we plant. And then we do that when they're small and we transplant them in the garden. We do a whole nother thing of that dust. Again, helps them with pests, helps them be disease resistant, increases their root balls, which increases the entire uptake of nutrients in the health of the entire plant. So is a, a little things that I like to do, there, there it is. The Jiffy Sevens, some great organic seeds. You know, Botanical Interest is right down in Denver. And we get a lot of our seeds through uh, Botanical Interest. But there's also, if you're looking for organic seed catalogs or companies or heirloom seed cogs, there's like a whole a family that produces this catalog uh, on this farm out east. I can't remember what the name of it is, but Julie brings home a copy of it every year. And it's like, it's, it's awesome. It's just, you know. People have been passing these down. Like, this is the most amazing melon. This is the most amazing tomato. And, and, and it's taken a long time for it to be able to be this, whatever that is. Um, so uh, you might be able to get, and the seeds that you save, like we saved them at the end of last year, and then we'll plant them at, this, at the beginning of this year. So eventually they'll dry out. All right, let me grab those. Ree, 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 ree. Sorry. Um, <laughs> this is my teacher who's safe with knives and chainsaws in his living room. <laughs> oh, all right. So I told you about the electric chainsaw. This is a Soch 220 class. I feel good about battery powered chainsaw. So I go to buy a battery because my dad's like, you can't have a battery. It's going to run out right away. Gotta go buy another battery. So I go to buy another battery and they're $179. And the Ryobi guy is standing there and he starts talking to me. I got an auger with like a, a battery powered auger because I'm getting like nine trees and our fences got blown over. And anyway, battery powered auger. The battery is 179 bucks. The auger is 300 bucks. 
So I just bought the auger for like 120 bucks and I needed an extra battery anyway. Let me tell you, there are some really environmentally amazing friendly ways. So, and I think it's programmed in us to dig holes. Like, you know, dogs are like, like they love it. I, I love it playing in the dirt. So I, you should have seen all the holes I was digging all over the farm last night. Julie came home. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so battery powered tools. All right. Dad's kitchen, Downing's kitchen. Here we go. Um, so this is, uh, an organic green pepper. It's seen better days. I don't know. I could still, I'm still going to use it, uh, to eat too, but I got one here. Oh, can't quite, and I'll tip over my computer. Well, you've seen somebody cut a green pepper, so that's not all that exciting. I'm just going to do it. All right. <laughs> all right. So, oh, this is not as thrilling as it should be. Um, all right. So for a lot of green peppers, you cut them off and either hang into the top or right inside there. See the seeds? But like most of the time, there's a lot. This is like, a, I don't know, a hundred. Um, this looks like it has maybe a couple dozen on it. You know, see the little seeds there? And then, so I'm going to just kind of, with these, it's easy uh, because it doesn't have that like ectoplasm around it, the Ghostbusters ectoplasm that tomatoes do. So tomato seeds are like a lot harder to save. Okay, here we go. That, that, that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There's only 16 seeds here. It would be dozens, but there they are. So with these, I wouldn't wash them off um, because you don't need to. Uh, I would just put these. Now you've got 16 pepper plants. I mean, assuming that you get at least five fantastic peppers off each plant, you'll probably get more, right? I mean, again, it's, it's just like a number thing. It's a math thing, the infiniteness of being able to seed save or plant from seeds that you grow. Why, you know, why do it another way unless you're trying to get something new like, oh, I want this, whatever, then, then it makes sense to buy the seeds. Right. But, um, you know, but buying organic seeds, then you can just, that's power that's in your hands. Then, okay. All right. So you put that on wax paper. Uh, I found is the best. I used to do this on paper towels, but like, especially the, um, the tomato ones stick and they become really, really impossible, uh, you know, to save or you put them away and they're still wet. So in Colorado, I think is the perfect place to save seeds because it's so dry, right? Like it's not gonna stay wet in the Midwest. If I spill something in my car and it smells like, you know, moldy or wet, that's like could be there in Minnesota for like six months to a year. It could, it could just never fully dry out, but in Colorado it will. So seed saving, seed collecting in Colorado, I think is really, really easy and really awesome. All right, this is a, Ah, it's a tiny tomato. I don't even know if these little cherry tomatoes are going to have anything in them. So let's look. I don't know. I don't have any tomatoes that I'm growing myself right now. Oh, yeah. Hooray. Okay, of course. <laughs> All right. There they are. Can you see them? Oh, there they are. And so what I'm going to do is squeeze it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about the the uh and i should do my own cooking show though um all right so here's what you do and then whoa that's gonna come off there so i'm gonna put this over here all right so you'll see that there's kind of like all that ectoplasm over it or whatever so what i like to do is take these seeds so how many are here uh, just in a cherry one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve three five twenty twenty one three one okay so there's approximately thirty in one half of one cherry tomato, right? Um, that's that's so many cherry tomato plants, it's ridiculous. That's enough for you and your friends and that super cute dog that's been cruising into our class today. So take these, and I, I don't have it, I didn't grab it for class, um, but you get one of those, um, like uh, the, me the mesh colanders, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's like like kind of like the screen from your house, but it's in like a colander. It's something that you would wash stuff in. That's the best. And then go cold water. And then you put all these seeds from a tomato. Don't mix them because then you won't know what you're planting, which I do kind of frequently anyway. And then it's a surprise. So I don't know. There's also that. But do it 
cold water and you get that, you know, the setting where you have uh, like the spray and you just spray it and you, you kind of push the seeds gently and you push all the ectoplasm through and you keep going with the seeds and you push them through and then you take those seeds and they'll be wet, that's fine. Uh, and you just tap them out upside down, the little colander on, um, here, I'm just gonna keep this up here. You do that on the wax paper and they won't stick. If you do the tomato seeds on pretty much anything else, they will stick. The wax paper, they won't. That ectoplasm will kind of disappear. You've like removed a lot of it. And then there you have it. It's like a day later and did you, you move kind of the wax paper and you know, hundreds or thousands of seeds slide in there and you can put them in any kind of container you have that's dry and cool, store them in a dry, cool place. And then you have all the awesome plants for next year. And you know what? Why do it ahead of time? Like, like I like doing it at the end of the year when I'm like, I did not like that tomato. Why am I even growing that tomato? These over here, oh, I've got to have those chocolate cherries again. Those were like they were, they were amazing. Got to have those chocolate cherries again. So then you can decide what you like, you know, and save the stuff that you like. You don't have to save everything by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but then you can start to kind of get that garden going in the direction that you want it. Now, not everything is, is, is easy to save um, as seeds necessarily from peppers and tomatoes. Um, some stuff's a little bit easier. Like I said, the dry marigold seeds just pop right out into a bag and they're ready to roll. You don't have to wash them. You don't have to dry them. Um, but uh, so, all right. Um, again, I had a, uh, not again, but I had a friend, Pete Lander, and he passed away in a plane accident, but Pete uh, had a farm in Minnesota and could build a kiln to fire pottery. He could skin a goat. He could do just about anything, pour a found cement foundation, you name it. And he was, uh, for many years, working with um, Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota, growing all sorts of wildflower seeds and wild grasses that they don't have enough of. So if you're like, someday I wanna do that, but I don't wanna grow food, the demand for seeds is pretty big. And so whether that like is you're interested in restoring prairie, that's what they were doing in Minnesota, restoring prairie grasses and really important prairie seeds. Again, after a while, things can get taken out or poisoned out or picked out of the ecosystem, but it's part of that really valuable chain. So. In addition to this, if you're growing a garden, lots of flowers, right? Because you wanna bring pollinators to your plants. If you've got pollinators all over your tomatoes, just like we talked about with coffee or other things like that, the more pollinators you have, the more fruit you yield, the better quality. Uh, so many, so many things like that. We're even doing a couple plum trees this year and the trees that are coming in tomorrow. Um, and we've got a couple ones on our land already that we just found here. We found a plum tree last year after five years here. <laughs> in the way back by the edge of our property. And it was amazing. So we're gonna do a couple more of those. Um, all right, so questions about any of this. Um, you know, any about the seed saving, anything about planting a garden. Right now, I'm super excited because people are doing a ton of indoor gardening. You should see the indoor gardens in Britain that they're doing in old bomb shelters. Uh, it's It's like, it's amazingly inspiring. So some people growing their food inside, some people growing their food outside. What are some considerations out here in Colorado? We have been infested with plague level grasshoppers for the last few years. That two years ago when I didn't wrap my garden, last year I tried to get like that stuff for tennis courts. That's like the green mesh stuff in concerts and I bought it and wrapped my whole garden in it. Cut down the grasshoppers by 90, 95%. The year before there were so many in our garden that the second something was gonna turn red and it was, and the grasshoppers were able to chew through the skin because the skin wasn't hard enough, they do it. And then it would just be destroyed immediately. So pests are a big deal. Um, planting flowers not only brings pollinators, but if you're doing things like marigolds, you can keep away deer, you can keep away pests and other bugs. And you, so there's all sorts of bio controls, bio pest controls, I think, again, the best. I'm never gonna spray anything in my garden particularly uh, if I think that it might slow down pollinators from coming. Now, wasps, a lot of wasps in my garden, uh, a ton of sunflowers. <clears throat> the wasps are busy pollinating. I've never been stung once. Um, and I think there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of value in, in doing that. Biopest control uh, out here, also the fires. Imagine 
what the sun looks like normally. Now, put a filter on it, right? That would be like months and months of that fire piece of the smoke or the sun through that. And it really did change things. I think it stretched things out a little bit last year. My plants in between the fruit, maybe had longer nodes. Um, we still had a really great harvest, but, but there's a, a lot of considerations every year. That's, not, that's why farming is hard. Uh, two or three years ago, right at the end of the season, um, a hailstorm came in and wiped out just so many things. So it's difficult. Um, that's, you know, another reason probably people are finding different places to grow in because our climate <clears throat> is not as, you know, reliable because of the different extremes as it might have once been. So growing conditions outside are already a challenge, particularly a place like Colorado where it's so dry, um, you know, which is a benefit for certain things and and drying plants out and having them drink fast and not getting logged down with too much water. And so there are some advantages to it for sure. Uh, questions, any questions about seed saving? What kind of plants we've grown? Um, I don't know, anything else about this? I have a quick question. So I know it depends on the plant, but when will you like start taking those like big trays out and like planting them in the ground? So these trays then go into little uh, four inch cups or not cups, but like, you know, and then there'll be 30 some of those to a tray. So we step them up and I don't go bigger because I really like their roots to get bound up. Like if you go and they're kind of rushing it and you turn the plant upside down and you don't see really awesome roots. A lot of times people will plant those tomato plants in bigger things just to make the plants look bigger, like, and then charge more. But the root balls are really important. So I like to, I like to let them, you know, the roots really do that. The main thing is, is it going to freeze? You know, I can't even put them out in my greenhouse because like, like I said, my bathroom upstairs is taken over by this. The downstairs laundry room will get taken over by this when they go into the four cups or the four inch cups. And then eventually we've got to get them out to the greenhouse. But if it still is going to freeze at night, then no bueno, you know, and, and sure you could have heating pads in that little greenhouse, but unless the whole greenhouse maintains a constant temperature, um, you know, I wouldn't till then. I mean, a lot of planters and farmers say after Mother's Day, but I have rushed years ago when we weren't doing our own stuff. I bought like Julie, I saved up money. I bought $200 worth of plants, planted a whole garden for her on Mother's Day was like, check it out. And that afternoon, a hailstorm destroyed everything. That's another reason why seed saving is fantastic. You might want to have twice the plants, but that costs twice the money unless you're doing it yourself, right? In which case, then you can be like, eh, I was taking a risk getting them out early. Didn't work out. Um, same is true at the end of the season. We had that freak snow, right? Remember that in September or something like that? I mean, we got tarps, we got tents, I got heaters, I covered plants. I wrapped plants in Christmas lights. That's actually what they do in citrus places, um, orchards, uh, if they know they're going to have a frost because 75% uh, of the energy that comes out of Christmas lights is in the form of heat, even though it's minimal. Random dad fact. I don't know. Uh, so we did that and then most of the garden finished. But if we hadn't covered it, you know, so frost is a big deal and can really stunt the plants, you know. It'd be better to err always on the side of safe because once those plants get a little frost damage, then it slows the whole thing down. You know, then the plant's not growing as fast. It's trying to repair itself. You know, I mean, it's a whole thing. It's a whole organism. Producing fruit is just part of what it does. Um, yeah, I probably, did I answer that even? I hope so. Good. Okay. Any other, other questions? Is anybody here doing a garden on their patio at their parents' someone house? Asked, Go ahead. Sorry. Someone asked a question in the chat about their plant. Oh, sorry, I've had the chat closed today for once. Uh, oh, wow, I missed a bunch. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Where do I start with this? Uh, use, okay, uh, has to summarize. Do you have to repot all of those? Yep. Yeah, all those little tiny things from the little jiffies, from our little jiffies. Or, 
I, I do that, yeah, and then straight into the ground. Illegal to force people to destroy a crop, farmer did not get seeds from the attacker. Uh, well, the answer to that question, Samuel, is that companies like these big agribusiness companies can afford and they have a, a whole army of lawyers. And the local farmer who has genetic material that's not his does not have that same army of lawyers. Um, but like so if you have a seed that's been passed down through like a family or that you bought from someone who had it passed through their family, then how can a big agribusiness sue that person? Well, it's science. They're going to show you their genetic material that they have patented in yours. So although yours is your thing, once it contains their thing, then it's not. Do you see what I mean? So that's, and, and these trucks are often driving by these places and they're not covering the trucks and they're not doing anything not to cross pollinate. So yeah, I mean, it's something that has been litigated time and time again. I wish that this would go more often in the side of the small farmer rather than the large agribusiness. But, you know, once you've, and that's the slippery slope with patenting life. Think about it. Patenting a seed is a big effing deal. But now they're trying to put and have put patents on like living animals. This is our salmon. Well, what happens when that salmon goes out in the wild populations and suddenly all those salmon have that genetic? Does that mean that company owns those or a pig or a, patenting life is like, I can't, I don't even, I can't even start that discussion today because it's so mind bending. Um, problems with my basil plant, leave it outside, water it every day, but it's super droopy. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's great when it's in the sun. At night, if it's wet, the roots are gonna get chilly and it's gonna bring the temperature of that whole plant down. Also, I can grow stuff outside like nobody's business. I've almost killed every house plant I always have because of overwatering. So let a plant drink until it starts to droop because plants like to get totally dry and then water them and then really water them. But most people are like on a regimen and they don't use their fingers. You walk by a plant, put your fingers in it, right? Lift it. Is it light or is it heavy and wet? If it's heavy and wet, let it drink, let it drink, let it drink. Too much watering, root rot, that sucker will, that's the quickest way to kill it. Um, all right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, any online resource to learn how to plant seeds and grow plants? I would like to plant uh, three minutes. Let me look and see what my best online sort of resources would be. Um, uh, worked at a farmer's market. Oh, passive solar tech, Parker. Yeah, you can build little uh, hot houses or a little like, you know, where you get like a window, an old window at resource somewhere and you build around it. And then you put that and start plants outside if it can keep that like um, warm. Um, that's path, great passive solar use. Worked at a farmer's market last fall, a few days before that storm. Uh, I'll bought extra lights, tarps for the produce farms. It was really cool, but also snuck up on Colorado. Uh, uh, yeah, last, I mean, I saw it coming for days though. I like, I, I bought out all the tarps. Okay, here's how, here's how committed I was. I went to Walmart during COVID. I mean, uh, you already guessed, I'm not the guy that's ever going to Walmart or any big store during COVID. I risked that for those tarps because of my garden. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. And yes, I'm dissing on Walmart. They send that money every single day out of that community to other banks that don't benefit that community. Yeah, I'll rip those folks apart in a number of ways, support local. Uh, and I have a Star Wars addiction and I used to even like go check for Star Wars toys there, but I've even weaned myself of that. Oh my goodness. Probably because Julie would call me a hypocrite all the time. All right, give me free succulents uh, and draw one time. I got one I accidentally left at the window. So when it got below freezing, yep. I've witnessed the horrors. I've witnessed the horrors of frost. I have witnessed the horrors of frost. Uh, there are some things when we get around to a live classroom again all the time that I'm gonna miss actually about this. Can we do a live chat that streams in front of the class? That's <laughs> like, like I, the contribution, people are contributing, they're contributing more, you know, because a lot of people don't like to talk in class. And then if you do, you're the one person that's like, I'm always saying something that was me. Um, all right, CSU extension resource, a lot of pamphlets. Oh, yeah. S yeah, go to CSU, stay with CSU. They've got, they've got a seed bank, they have a ton of knowledge. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's a lot of knowledgeable people on campus. That's that's great too. And you know, if anybody ever wants to come out here to the farm and work, it's not glamorous. I can't pay you. I can give you eggs. But in the past, I've had students that are like, yeah, I've never done this. I want to do that. Well, it, come on out and here's a shovel. I mean, that's what I got to do now is dig holes for the garden posts that were blown over. Uh, we've got nine trees coming in. I've got to take all the material. So I take all the material from the garden last year, put it in the middle of the garden and burn it. Okay. And then I take that ash and I spread it throughout the garden because we have so many sunflowers, hundreds that I plant in between and all around our garden to bring pollinators and they will actually suck up potassium from the soil. So if you burn them, then you will get to redistribute that potassium um, and that ash and all of that valuable stuff that's in the ash throughout the rest of your garden. So I still have to do that as well. But um, you know, if you wanna volunteer, you wanna help out or something like that, uh, Sometimes people do and they really want to, and, and then a, a ton of people don't, and I get that. And so you, you certainly can if you reach out to me. Let me let Alma out. All right. So in, oh, what type of trees? Uh, two honey locusts, two maples, uh, two oaks, two uh, cottonless cottonwoods. I mean, you know, look at my face. Just my face says everything about cottonless cottonwoods. I don't know, um, but whatever. Excuse me, I'd like my, it just sounds like privilege, doesn't it? I'd like my cottonwood cottonless, please. I, really? I'd like my beer alcohol free. Oh, no way, I guess that some people do that. That's a bad analogy. Anyway, um, so I, I guess maybe it's a good analogy. If you still want to enjoy that cottonwood without, Getting drunk? No, that's a bad analogy. All right. Um, so any other questions about anything on the farm? Anything like that? Or anything with seeds or planting? Uh, we're Ravensdale Farm on Facebook. Uh, we do a few socially distant safe concerts out here. Um, we sell organic plants. And this is not a plug to buy stuff from me. Um, this is just what we do on our farm. Music chickens, eggs, um, duck eggs, and a lot of plants. And even if I didn't sell the starters, I would just grow this many in hopes that I could find places for <laughs> all of them by volume. Because sometimes you get wiped out. Sometimes planting a volume with a little extra or a garden with a little extra volume makes sense because there's going to be losses, you know. Um, there's going to be molds or funguses. There's going to be things that, you know, we got a blight uh, our second year out here that I thought it was that. I looked it up and it looked like that. And then I started ripping out tomato plants and it it didn't even matter. It just was like, and I thought I was trying to stay ahead of it. So you never know, you know, um, even for people that have been growing food for a long time or trees or, you know, plants or anything like that. It's, that's kind of the thing I also like about it. Um, it's not, not very predictable necessarily. There's a lot of, a uh, lot of elements, a lot of unknown elements. Got to be very dude when you farm. Very slow and very dude. Uh, that's how I'm going to be when I use that auger. Very slow, very deliberate. <laughs> but farmers will tell you that. I'm not a farmer like a farmer like some people. Most farmers, many farmers are missing a limb, missing fingers, you know, going slow, doing all of this at a dude clip is exactly the pace uh, that is required in a lot of these instances. Okay. Uh, we had cottonless cottonwood tree. It looked like snow. Yeah. Totally. In my old neighborhood, and it was, it was like snow and the boys would go around and actually pretend that when they were little uh, in Loveland. Um, so uh, I'm going to take the plants back up to the room. I'm going to go get that. I have the study guide. I just need to put it in announcements. So expect that within the hour. I'll post this video. If you have any questions whatsoever about um, the project, you know that we're available for you. If you have any questions about the exam, same thing open lines of communication. Um, please use us as a resource. And if anybody finds out any really, there's a, you know, there's all sorts of groups on Facebook. There's like a Fort Collins or Northern Colorado cultivators. There's uh, farms in town that uh, trade seeds and have like their own little seed banks and they share seeds with people just because they want people to plant. So do you need a lot of money for a garden? No, you don't. 
Um, I think there's a lot of resources, including myself. If you really want to grow a plant, I'll give you a plant. <laughs> if you really want a tomato, I'll give you one. Um, yeah. All right. If there's nothing else, uh, be good people, do good things, mask up, be safe. Thanks, Jared Polis, for extending that uh, mask mandate so that we can stay safe. Um, and then I saw a baseball game yesterday in Texas that made me exactly sure that I know what humans are all about. And that's why I'm a sociologist. So that did not surprise me. It, it did. It, uh, it was, is cringy still a thing? Can you still say cringe? Get away with saying cringy. I'm going to say it. I, I haven't cringed so hard <laughs> since I saw that since yesterday. So that's why I'm not doing any of that today. No social media, just teaching and going to go outside and dig some more holes. Anyway, uh, take care, everybody. Reach out if you need something. Peace. Have a good one. Thank you so much. This Thank was you. awesome. Yeah, I'll do more stuff like this too. This is fun stuff. I'll, I'll do a mobile one around the farm where I just take people on a virtual tour of the farm. Uh, that'd be cool too. Anyway, take care, everybody. I would love that. That would be awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.